We're good to go? Okay, so I guess I should start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Olivia Knight. I'm a scenic painter, mural artist and painter. I'm originally from London, UK, and I moved to Vancouver just over a year ago now. So it's definitely been a roller coaster with six months of that being within COVID. Um, but hopefully I get to talk to you a little bit about how much that has actually changed my life and led me to where I am now. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of history of where I've come from with my creative and artistic training. So harking back to my academic school years, I went through a very traditional training. So it was drawing what you saw, still lives, oil paintings, oil pastels, um, and just becoming very competent with a whole range of um, materials. But the only problem with this kind of um, training was that I really struggled to think outside the box and find any real, I guess, creativity. I became very, very good at drawing exactly what I saw. So portraits, life drawing, um, houses and things like that, commission based work. Um, and I was praised for that at school. So I carried on with that momentum, but I really, I always knew there was something missing that I really couldn't tap into this inner self that was trying to get out, but didn't know how to express itself. Um, so I really felt like I was a bit stuck and I was stuck inside a box and I wasn't able, like I say, to express myself fully, but my traditional training gave me an enormous range of skills that later on in life I would find were invaluable to mural painting nowadays. So school happened and art was everything to me. I just spent my whole acad academic life focusing on art. And that was really inspired by a teacher I had when I was 11 who I just adored and I wanted to do everything I could to um, impress her. I thought she was so cool and I was like, I want her to think I'm a good artist. So I worked really hard at that. And then I left school and decided to do something a little bit different. So I went to University of the Arts London and studied set design. I wanted to study set design to do something a little bit different. I knew that I had the fine art skills under my belt. And I also saw it as an opportunity to really just go wild with ideas. I knew that the film industry would, you could come up with the most inventive ideas and they would make a film about it, um, like Avatar and stuff. This, these are the sorts of things I was interested in, mythical stories and just insane ideas. Um, and so I went to art school and this was pretty much at the time when everything started transitioning to digital. That me being a fine artist, I did not want to do that. <laughs> I was completely set on doing everything by hand, using the traditional techniques. And I actually originally thought that digital took away from from the amazing skill involved in hand drawing and stuff like that. So I rebelled and I didn't learn anything on computers, which was a bit of a mistake because it meant that I really struggled to get a job as a set designer because I couldn't use computers. But what I did find is that the things I enjoyed most during my degree was actually things like set painting, props building, prop sourcing, set dressing. I actually found I wasn't that interested. I was interested, but I wasn't as interested in the design element. I was more interested in making and being hands-on, being practical, um, and just being involved in the whole energy of things rather than the pre-prep of a film. 
Um, so yeah, I I think that I, I found that I was leaning away from set design quite naturally um, and sticking to my guns of wanting to make things by hand and be practical. Um, so yeah, this was a whole bunch of films I worked on, or one film in particular. Um, but then I finished university, tried to become a set designer and found that nobody would really pay me for anything. Um, I finished uni in the middle of the recession and there really were not many jobs around. Um, so I was doing all this set design work basically for free. And I did that for almost two years before I just realized it wasn't sustainable at all to carry on like that. So I had a friend who worked for a scenic arts company and I thought, sounds great. I want to do that. Um, so I joined a company uh, called Souvenir and they focus on doing all the sets for West End productions, which is basically the same as the Broadway musicals and theatre shows. And I just loved it. I thought it was so awesome. I was learning all these creative skills that I really wanted to learn and all these techniques and using tools. Um, yeah, I always wanted to be practical, like building things myself. So this was great. Um, and I came straight in and immediately started as a scenic painter. And I think one of the things I enjoyed the most with this was color matching and replicating things exactly as they were before. So we would either get a model or um, the previous show notes of how the, the design should be done. And then it was my job to take this information and replicate exactly what they wanted as a designer. They said, I want this, 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 this. Um, so I guess that really did link back to my technical mind of how can I replicate something exactly as it is um, and being very perfectionist about it. But that also meant that I was still not tapping into my creative side of my brain. I was still just doing what I saw and doing it accurately and not thinking outside the box at all. But having said that, I learned this enormous range of skills um, and weird techniques involved in replicating what I saw. So something like this floor, which is for the Lion King musical production, there's about 30 processes that have gone in, 30 processes that have gone into this to achieve this look. Um, and you just honestly wouldn't know because you can't really see them. It's just that they build up to get to a certain point. So there's like splattering and texturing and water and all sorts of things. Um, and yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. It was really awesome to be in a creative job surrounded by other creatives. Um, it was a very high pressure job and it was a lot of really long hours, really long days and a lot of stress. <laughs> um, here's a few more examples of things that we were doing. So this is for the Harry Potter set. And what's cool about all this is that in our studio, we made everything from scratch. So we had carpenters, um, carvers, welders, painters, obviously, fiberglasses. So everything here has been made from the very scratch. So the bricks have been hand carved by the carvers and then it was cast and vacuum formed. And then it comes to us and we would texture it and do all sorts of different things like spreading the texture and adding more texture. Um, and then after that, we start painting. And again, there's per brick about 10 different coats of paint and 
washes and stuff like that that have gone into trying to make it look as authentic as possible. Um, and then we do grouting and overspraying. And what was really exciting about this was you had to really look at the big picture as a whole. So you, you're not going to look at each single brick and wonder if each brick looks like a brick. You have to be able to see the big picture. And even this is one of, I mean, 20 flats or something. There was, it was so many bricks and you had to see it as this huge brick wall and how you could make it all tie together to look real. But obviously it's made of something that's really lightweight so that it can be flown in and out of the theater and moved easily. And the same really applies to the metal work. So this is all supposed to be cast iron effect and it's all made of wood. And then we just go through the same process, texturing, 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 um, adding all these little details, spraying. Um, yeah, so many processes that go into it. Um, to make it look authentic, but obviously the trick is that it's not. Um, so it's really a great set of skills that I learned. And this is going, having a look at the props that we were making. So there were carvers and fiberglasses, and we would all be involved in each department. So if something needed to happen in the props department, we were there to help. And for me, that was so exciting. I, just to have all of that knowledge under my belt of how to use tools, how to cut wood, how to build wood, wooden structures, and how to carve foam, how to fiberglass. Um, and eventually it would come to us and we would paint it. So then you're also learning a lot of interesting things about different paint and paint applications and what you need to do to the surfaces, all sorts of little things like that. And this was a play that, or a musical that you guys may know here in Canada, it was Come From Away, which was based in Newfoundland. Well, the story is from Newfoundland when the planes from 9-11 were grounded um, because of all the chaos and planes from India and Thailand all landed in Newfoundland and it was how all these communities came together in time of crisis. Um, in these pictures I'm trying to show how big the spaces that we were dealing with and how large the scale of the projects were. We would put the whole floor into the studio, we would have all these trees that were hand carved, hand textured, and had rope and all sorts of different things applied to them to create the texture. So it just became this giant workforce unit of everybody all hands on deck doing all these different components that would eventually result in the image on the right, which is what the set looked like in the end. Ah, yeah, so all that was going on and I was really enjoying being a scenic painter but I was reaching burnout. I was just exhausted, I was stressed and I was feeling that I wasn't achieving what I wanted to achieve. I was still very much stuck in that mode of doing someone else's work, replicating what I saw in front of me and not thinking outside the box, not tapping into my own creativity and I think I was scared to look inside and find and see what I could find in there. And I think I was worried that there wasn't anything in there. All I was was, you know, someone who could draw really well. So I, I guess I did the cliche thing and decided I needed to go find myself. Um, so so I went traveling <laughs> and. I went to India first, completely fell in love and stayed there for six months. And it all happened quite organically, really. I started to just paint small murals wherever I stayed. 
and in, in exchange I got food or accommodation and stuff like that it was just a nice exchange program and I just enjoyed doing my own work for the first time and I got put in touch with this quite well-known mural artist called Suresh Nair who was in Varanasi so I got this 30-hour train across India to meet him joined him and a team and we went to Bodh Gaya which is the birthplace of Buddha and I was assisting him on this mural and it was just the most amazing experience that I was surrounded by these incredible artists in India who welcomed me with open arms and thought I was the best thing that I think they thought I was the famous English artist but I really wasn't <laughs> um, but it was great they thought I was amazing and I learned so much from them and so I was working on this mural with Suresh and the team which was mostly carving into the concrete with actual sticks we found on the floor um, and then setting the mirrors into the mural and then after that we painted it just one colour but it was really an awesome experience. We had inaugurations and meetings with the Prime Minister and I was dressed up every day in a sari to go to these shows and we had an art exhibition where I exhibited some art and so I ended up traveling with this group of artists for about a month I went back to Varanasi with them and I think that was really the first time I was so awestruck by the fact that this is something that people could do like you could be an artist and you could live off that and you could become well known and people would buy your art um and so yeah I very much looked up to them and was inspired by what they were doing and I I think that was a big sort of game changer for me um and it kind of propelled me forward for the rest of my travels so I then went off to Cambodia Thailand everywhere else in Asia and I did the same thing I exchanged my murals for accommodation and food and I think the biggest part of that was building such a great community and meeting so many amazing people. And so I traveled for about a year in Asia before I ended up in New Zealand. Um, I spent two years living in New Zealand and I stayed away from scenic painting. I think I was quite traumatized by <laughs> um, the stress that I had been under in the UK. I tapped into it later on before I left New Zealand I started scenic painting again um, but then I left and I went to Samoa and when I was in Samoa I stayed in this place called Tia Papata Art Centre where I basically lived in a tree house and I was teaching art to local kids from the community and also older adults who were suffering from mental health issues and I could see how important it was for me to give back what I had received when I was younger um, basically to tr really try and support people and show them that it doesn't matter what art you're creating it's just so important to be creating and to try and lead people away from this false concept that if you are if you can draw perfectly then you're an artist and if you can't then you're not an artist i think people think you have to be good at art to be an artist you know in a technical sense but i think some of the greatest painters and artists that we have they're not technically skilled they're creative they think outside the box and they have these wild ideas that for the longest time i was so jealous that people could do that because I really had no access to that side of my brain. And eventually, so I was here for a month and at the end of it all, I painted this mural. Um, it was all around the whole building and it started off as a big community project with all the kids from the local community. And I just, 
I loved being able to give back and have the ability to share what I knew with other people and just see how much the community responded to having some art and how much fun everybody found it. So I started to realize like this is this is what I want to be doing. Then fast forward a little bit. <laughs> I went back to the UK. I went back to that my scenic painting job and I was just not happy again. Uh, felt suffocated and trapped. So I moved to Canada and I did the same thing. <laughs> I got a job as a scenic painter. Um, and really it was great because I, I needed a job. I needed a stable income and it was a great job. I became the lead painter in the company. And um, yeah, it was, it was exactly what I needed at the time. But slowly, slowly, the feelings of unfulfillment kept coming back. And I think I got to crunch point where I was like, I know I can do something else and I need to be doing something else. Um, so I was getting more and more unhappy. And I really was looking for a way out. But I, I didn't have it in my field of vision that you could survive as an artist without a job. So I very much focused on my career and thought, I need a job. There's no way I can survive without it. And then COVID happened and I lost my job. And I couldn't help but feel like it was a blessing in disguise because I feel like I'd been asking for it mentally, um, despite the fact that it was this awful pandemic that was just so stressful and challenging for everybody um, but I really tried to flip it on its head and turn it into making the most of this experience and how I could change my life now this is that was the moment to, to change um, I was originally in Mexico when everything shut down and um, I'd gone there to paint murals with a friend and then Canada announced it was closing its borders. So I got there three days later, I had to leave. Um, and I was pretty devastated when I came home because I thought that was going to be the moment that my life changed and I was good at paint murals. Um, so I came back quarantined and then Canada started, well, Vancouver started to close up and the shop started boarding up. And it became quite depressing and just sad to see the streets empty and everybody had, was so worried about what was going on. Nobody knew really what was going on. Um, and this woman, Kim, in Gastown started to paint the boards around her store because she had the triangular building in Gastown and about 10 windows. Um, so it just looked really depressing everything was it was like a post-apocalyptic scene with boarded up shops everywhere empty streets so we really started the movement to paint the boarded up shops and that was just an amazing experience i found another opportunity to give back to the community and the feedback we got from the community was just so touching Everybody was so happy that there was some colour on the streets that brought some life back into the area. And whilst everybody was feeling so anxious and concerned about the future, they could still walk past one of these murals and feel a bit better and get some joy out of, out of the hardships of what was going on. So my friend and I basically just kept going. We painted loads of murals around Gastown and then we started cycling around, finding more places to paint. Uh, and it just kept snowballing. More and more people wanted their shops painted. And we were doing this all for free. Um, we weren't asking for money because we knew that everybody was going through really challenging times. We just said, if you pay for the paint, we're happy to do a mural for you. 
And yeah, I think really that was that time that I re that I was looking for where my whole life changed. Everything, I lost my job, I lost everything that I, all the expectations I had of myself that I needed a career, I needed to succeed, I needed a stable income. That didn't exist anymore. There weren't jobs to be had. And there was just no sign of my industry coming back anytime soon. So, yeah, I told myself this is the time to commit completely to my art. And I did. And it, the feedback was amazing. Um, I realized how important it was for me to be making public art for people that would brighten their day and bring some happiness to people. It doesn't matter whether there's a pandemic going on or not. I just really want to help to bring some color and life to the city. And like I say, bring some joy to people's day, hopefully making people feel a bit better. Um, so these were some of the things that we were doing during that time. And eventually that all led to some paid work. So people started seeing what I was doing and started commissioning murals themselves. Um, so I was like, great, I've done it. <laughs> I'm an artist. Um, so yeah, I, I had to start thinking about what messages I was trying to get across, like what I was trying to do with my art. And it's funny, until this talk, I hadn't really thought about where my ideas were coming from they were just sort of coming out of my brain and reflecting back i can see that so much of my art is all about storytelling and that's all very much connected to my set design background um i was always trying to tell a story and portray these scenes of things so they always have a, a backstory that's connected to the person who I'm doing the picture for or whatever the scenario is that the mural is going into. My key points were just to try and tell a story and create a beautiful scene or an uplifting scene or something that means something to people. So the wish you were here one at the bottom is very much, it's a view of Vancouver and this was done during COVID. And it was, the idea was to have this lovely whimsical view of Vancouver because despite the fact we were in the middle of a global pandemic, we were still so lucky to be in such a beautiful place and not to forget that and be grateful for the things that we do have and the beautiful views on our doorstep. So I then flipped everything on its head and played around with these unexpected colour palettes and this is, in my mind, um, from sunrise to sunset, but I know that it's a bit off. It, my colours just get carried away from themselves and I think, how can I get the most colour onto this? So yeah, um, I started to see a trend that my work was leaning towards these colour palettes that were a bit upside down, where I was flipping the world on its head a little bit and looking at things from a completely different direction. Um, I also found that I was really interested in abstract shadows and reflections and um, these sort of positive and negative spaces and whether they exist or flipping them around and turning the positive into the negative and sort of breaking the forms up a little bit more and fragmenting things. So I, st I started realizing that I obviously did have some creativity going on in my mind and this is all coming from all the things I've learned over the years as a scenic painter and as a set designer. And yeah, so here are a few more images of things I started to work on during COVID and then yeah it's all this sort of unexpected palette um, positive negative space 
shadows, reflections, breaking things up a bit. And in my mind, this is a scene. This is what I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to create a scene. And then somehow this is how it all sort of ends up coming out on the paper. Um, so yeah, I'm starting to see these sort of quite abstract things coming through in my work, which I actually never thought was in there. And then it took, a whole life change for me to realize that it was there. I just needed to tap into it a bit more. This is my last slide. Um, it's just another example really of stuff I've been doing recently. Um, again, positive, negative space, shadows, reflections. This is a whimsical view from an apartment in the West End on looking out over English Bay and Stanley Park. And I've just sort of changed things up a bit. In my mind, this also does, this is how I see the scene. <laughs> this is what sunset would look like. You'd get these lovely pink colors coming through. And so I guess my I'm trying to get my reality down on paper. And this is what is coming out. So yeah, that's the end of my talk. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Olivia. So once again, if you have any questions, you can either use the raise, raise hand uh, feature or just chat on, on, on the chat room and I will post the question. We already have here a few questions for, for Olivia. So the first question, Olivia, is do you think creativity comes better with or without pressure? I think without, for me personally, the more pressure I was putting on myself, the more I was struggling to find anything. I really was so stuck. I was like, I need to find something. And it wasn't there, it was an empty void. And the moment that I relaxed and just said, all right, I'm just gonna see what happens now. I have no expectations anymore. Um, things started to flow for me really and it started coming thank you so next question i have here is from set designer from a set designer to the mural art but what's the main difference between working with a big crew or working all by yourself do you like it more do you have a preference mm, it's a good question um i do like working alone um, because art for me is quite a meditative state. I get quite lost in the picture and don't really talk to anyone, but it is so important to have a team with you because um, when I've worked on my own, I do find that I get quite stressed. There's a lot of things that go into it. I know that's my own stress that I need to let go of, but there's a lot of things that need to be done and prep work and even just having someone around you makes it just a more fun experience. So I'm learning now after having done quite a few murals by myself that it's more important for me to have a team with me or just friends so that the experience is just as fun. Um, it's not just a huge focus game um that's all about just completing the mural i want it to be a sociable experience as well thank you so i have here another question so nature seems to inspire a lot um uh, it seems to inspire you a lot is that something that i do on purpose is that something that is conscious decision or you just love nature and end up always going to nature and as a source of inspiration yeah i the reason i moved to vancouver was for the nature and i feel like i live these sort of two lives where on the one hand i'm an artist and on the other hand i'm a hiker and a rock climber and i would like to live in the forest um so the reason i came here was for that experience to be in the mountains in the nature 
And it is interesting that the two have tied together quite well because my, me becoming the artist that I am now has only really happened as a consequence of being in Vancouver and being surrounded by the nature that obviously does inspire me so much. And I think for me, it is a happy place. It's a calming place. It's a relaxing space. And it's a way for me to get away from the world that I'm normally living in 24 seven. And, and that was what I was doing with set design as well. It was escapism, not that I'm trying to escape, but I'm providing a platform where you can hopefully just transport yourself for a couple of minutes to a different place and hopefully be relaxed and just live in a different universe for a small period of time. So I, I do think it's really interesting and actually I hadn't acknowledged it till quite recently that Vancouver and the nature around here has definitely had a huge impact on my artwork because it's so important to me. Thank you. So next uh, question that I have. So Michael is saying that as a young artist who is very uncertain about the future, do you think right now is riskier to be an artist than it was before? Personally, I would say no, because I think as a consequence of this pandemic, people want more art than ever before. Everybody's looking towards creatives right now to provide some color and some happiness out of something that we really don't know what's happening right now. It's totally uncontrollable. Um, so I've had more work than ever. And I think it has been in part due to the fact that we're in a bit of a crisis moment. And I think people value creatives a lot at the moment for being able to help during that time in an emotional support kind of way with the work that we do it's, it's designed to support and help people so for me I think this is the best time to get in there and start doing your art thank you uh, so we have here one more question. I mean, I, I think I can speak for Olivia. All the questions are um, welcomed. So keep bringing the questions as well. Uh, so the next question is, uh, do you draft your art before actually going and do that or it just comes naturally? Yeah, I always do a sketch before, before I do anything. But the sketches and the ideas seem to come quite naturally. I think what's fun is once the project is given to me, I sort of grab my iPad, which I will say to anyone is one of the best tools you can have as an artist because it allows you to do all this scribbling and doodling in a very loose manner and you, you have no attachment to it because when I start drawing, I'm like, oh, this has to be perfect. But with an iPad, you can draw it and you can undo stuff and you can erase it. So that's been a monumental tool for me as an artist. And what I'll do is I'll think, I'll start having these ideas going through my head. I'll pick up my iPad, start sketching random things. And then I can play around with color as much as I like and throw colors in there and change them and just really play with the image for as long as I like until I feel like it's what I want it to be. Um, so yeah, 100% every time I go and do something, I'll always do a drawing on the iPad beforehand. And I think mostly that's because I really enjoy it. It's kind of, maybe that's my version of a Game Boy or like a PlayStation. It's like, this is like, the most fun toy I have. So yeah, I'll definitely start playing around with things and seeing what comes to mind. Yeah. Oh, on that note, it's also very good for um, mural painting because you can, you can take photos of the wall that you're going to paint a mural on and then you can upload the photo into Procreate and then you can draw 
onto the wall, but digitally. So that gives you a really good understanding of how your art will look on a wall, how it will be positioned, whether it works, whether the colors work. So yeah, I definitely always draw first. Thank you. So I have here, it's a comment mixed with, with the question as well. So the, the comment is that, so I thoroughly enjoyed your, one of your first few slides where it was a painting of a man. Um, mm. ev do you ever consider going back to drawing people again? Yes, I do. Um, drawing portraits for me is, I, I really love doing that. I, I love pen and ink work, so the black and white line drawings. Um, it, I, I was doing it all the way up until COVID recently, and it was my favorite sort of meditative state because I get really stuck into the picture with these very small fine line um, details. I don't think it's ever something that I will give up on because it's, been the technique that's probably stuck with me the longest. I've, it's been something that I've been doing for about 10 years now. So I think what would be interesting is to bring that forward into my new direction and see how I can incorporate the pen and ink work with the bold colors. Um, yeah, portraiture is always something that I do really enjoy. Um, it's just more hard work because you don't want to get someone's portrait wrong. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a question that it's kind of following up from Michael. Michael's saying, um, do, port do, do you fear that portraits doesn't do the person's justice? Is that why you kind of try to shy away from drawing people? Hmm, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it can be a very personal thing. So you really don't want to do it, it like an injustice and, and not look like the person that you're drawing. Um, it's not something that I shy away from, but I did have some more recent commissions and it was someone's family and their children. And I started to realize how important this was that I, I captured the essence of the children and the family but all I was really having to work from was photographs and I think what I was realizing is that if I didn't know the person if I hadn't met them I was struggling to really capture the essence of them in a picture and just draw it you know and, and give it back to them and and have it look like their family member so I think moving forward and the best portraits I probably have ever done have been of family members or people I know because I have that connection and I, I already know their energy. So I think moving forward, I would probably say it would be nice to meet the person I was drawing before I just work from a photograph because that's difficult. <laughs> okay, so one more question here. Um, do will we be able to see you in the upcoming Vancouver Mural Festival? Oh, <laughs> um, I don't have my own wall this year. Obviously, I'm plugging for it next year and every year. Um, but I've been assisting on a lot of murals. So um, I've been working on a mural on West Third. Uh, yeah, West Third, just down Ontario. Um, the artist couldn't come across the border, they're stuck in Washington. So me and a couple of other artists executed the piece for her. So I don't have my own work, but you'll be able to see a couple of pieces that I have had a lot of input into. Thank you. I don't believe we have any more questions at this point. I'm going to just start saying my goodbyes, but if there's any, any question that you just and if you just remember, please feel free to, to send it. So I just wanna appreciate everyone again for, for joining us today. Appreciate, of course, Olivia for this beautiful and colorful uh, art talk. <laughs>
Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you. we'll, yeah, please, if you want to continue on um, seeing our, our talks and, and kind of getting in touch with, with what's upcoming, please visit our website. So VancouverChineseGarden.com. Also, please visit Olivia's website and Instagram. So all the information is on the email as well. So thank you all very much. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.